You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City, Long Island, and Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt. Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm coming to you once again from the Atlantic City Northeast Pizza and Pasta and Artisan Baking Expo. Uh, it's October, early October. Uh, we're going to be here for a couple of days talking to a lot of great people. And one of those great people is sitting with me right now. Uh, I, will, uh, I will call him... <laughs> Because I can now, the legendary Philip Korshak, because of some recent events, which we're going to talk about today. Yeah, yeah. Philip's been on before. Philip's been a regular on Pizza Quest. We've had him on uh, on on uh, uh, interviews. We've had him on live interviews, Zoom interviews. But now we're face to face here at at this event. And the only reason you're actually here today is because you do not have to be at your bagel shop, Korshak's Bagels, in, right. in the Italian market of South Philadelphia. Yeah. Because of why, Phil. Well, um, hi, Peter. Good to yeah, see good you. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, because the bagel shop closed. The bagel shop closed. Yeah. Uh, we were open for a little under two and a half years. We received unbelievable accolades. Yeah, I know. And national press. Yeah, I mean, national, national press. And, and, and huge, never, a, never a, a shortage of lines of people lining up to get the bagels. No, there were consistent lines, and we consistently sold out of a yeah. thousand or so bagels that we could make a day. And yet, you had to close. And yet, we had to close. the The long and the short of it is that one of the things that you'll hear around an expo like this is that if you want to be an owner. If you want to be a producer, if you want to run a shop, then be prepared to work 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah. And I was sort of prepared to do that for a year. And Because you, you're an industry veteran. You've been in the pizza side. You've been I've, you know, in the food, food world for forever. I have been doing this longer than I haven't yeah. as, as a being on this earth. Yeah. The reality of it, though, was that after two and a half years of working really hours that aren't fit for being in the universe with any kind of balance. Yeah, right. And in the one of my core values is work life balance, uh -huh. which I worked very hard to achieve for the employees. I really was neglecting for myself. And when I looked at the economics of it, to hire the person who would be the other me. Yes. Or that other person could be the who other could, me. Who could, take, could share the load and take some yeah. of the pressure off, yeah. Um, it wasn't economically viable within the context of how many bagels you can move and what it takes to pay people. Because you're make, you had a, a sort of a cap on how many you could make under your system. You're That's correct. hand forming every bagel. I you am, aren't using a bagel shaper. I'm not that. using a bagel shaper. I'm not using a cutter. I'm using a two-day ferment with a 24-hour biga in there. Yeah, there's a. am only boiling 18 bagels at a time, getting them into an oven in five-minute loads for five and a half hours, taking in a, two in a very to do that. small shop in South Philly. Yeah. You know, in a in a market that 
that's a fabulous market, but but it's what it's a, a great it's a tough place to work though because you're in confined spaces with yeah. limitations. It, it it's a it's a wonderful wonderful neighborhood, full of lots of very small independent makers. Yes, all of whom support one another. The the point of making more bagels than we currently could we would still top out at a level where the number of human beings to create it and for them to have work-life balance paid time off and something approaching a living wage yeah not really viable is at least is viable for them but not for you I, and still <laughs> arguable about where the line is for how value, viable it was for them. But at least they were getting a you know no. wage. When you're, I mean, you're you're working in a city, Philadelphia is you know uh, essentially notoriously a union city. Yeah. So you you're paying everybody union scale. You're yep. they're getting to work on the union rules, not on right. not on the artisan rules, which is you do whatever it takes to get the job done. Yeah. The so the artisan rule that I like that I really engage in and why I think dough has been salvation for me ah. is that it is about how can you be an accomplice to the process how can you help how and a lot of that staying out of the way uh -huh. and a lot of that is getting your ego out of the way and understanding that what it's going to be and what it will take is going to be variable every time yeah and so the question of how you can be really present is what the dough is asking you to do. What a gift. Yeah, yeah. Not really in line with lockstep yeah. uh, reality. Yeah, and, and, and a sort of a predictable uh, routine. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I enjoy that. And I will note that in working with the union, we were able to get to ideals and practicalities that beforehand hadn't been reached and were not of my divination. Uh -huh. A 60 hour, an up to 60 hours of paid time off for a full time worker earning it at one and a half hours for every 40 uh -huh. was not my idea. It was brought and I agreed to it. Uh -huh. And I'm really grateful for that. And I think that. 60 hours of paid time off for a human being working full time yeah. is reasonable. Yeah, if you if, from the standpoint of what the positives of what a union can bring is, it, it's there to protect the 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 sustainability of the workers themselves, yeah, their God safety, their longevity, and everything else by Absolutely. by putting in certain you know uh, barriers to employers to keep from overworking them and burning them out. Absolutely, even if it means that the owner himself has to work. And burn out. Well, and 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 the exactly, and that that onus is on me. I should have, in the very beginning, had another one of me yeah. who was as dedicated and as in the same mindset to be able to share it. Uh, the my understanding of what would be possible with the workforce and a newer understanding of the landscape given COVID altered what some of my prior perceptions of what work were uh -huh. to the realities of what they are. Well, let's go, let's back step a little bit to the original vision yeah. of Korshak Bagels was based on, you know, your philosophy of life. You're, everyone who knows you or has followed you on Instagram knows that you're, you're a poet as much as you are a, a baker. And, and and you're but and you and you have and you think deeply about things. I I I, ha, I am I I legendarily have no filter. And you and you're also well read. You've you've got wide ranges of sort of life reference yep. material. You, you 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 have I would say you know a personal philosophy, and and there was a vision behind Korshex. Can you talk a little bit about what that vision was? Yeah, the I'm very very fortunate that I think all the things that you're saying I agree with. The, the philosophy was that if you are running a neighborhood shop, the human beings working that should be able to live inside of that neighborhood. And so the question would be whether bakery work is pretend work that people are doing sort of to get through or to do as a hustle, uh -huh. or whether in fact it's respected enough inside of the community to be a part of it. And to that point, the people working in there 
should understand that the d difference between a person who is at the register taking the money or greeting the person in or making the bagel or boiling the bagel or baking the bagel or doing the dishes, that there is no difference between any of us. We are all bagel Cause, mongers. Because you're all working towards the same end together. Right. We are it's all, like a team. We are Exactly. But a team weirdly without any competition. So not only do I want to uh, destroy, eliminate the idea of a difference between front and back of house. Uh -huh. And I feel strongly about that one. The, I also want to divide or get rid of the delineation between the customer and the shop. So is there the, any embrace of us versus them is, has a feedback loop that is yeah. unhealthy. So it is true, they, the customer, are providing the money for the thing. The money they give for the thing provides for us a way to get through the day that is okay. And we all go in the circle around and in it. exchange, the customer gets back right. a, a beautiful product. Exactly. The it's a loop. <laughs> it is a beautiful loop. Like a almost not distrustful of Western philosophy, perfect circle, right? Uh -huh. Where we miss the mark or have been missing the mark is believing that the money is the emphasis and that the transaction is only transactional. Uh -huh. That I disagreed with. And I thought that if a person were the same person who made the dough and also maybe baked the bagel, that that person would be able to flow through the day inside the construct that was not limited to a position. So let, let me do, uh, unpack that a little sure. bit. Sure. So, so like for instance, you're saying, the person who's washing the dishes, there's no hierarchy of importance in this team. That's that right. If you're washing the dishes, you're just as important as the guy who's mixing the, the dough or running the ovens or the cash registers. Uh, and in a sense, you're just as important as me, the owner of the company. We're we're one unit, one team. Right. It's a very, it's it's very, uh, maybe could even be referred to as a communistic or socialist or communal. Let's yeah, say. Yeah. So take it out of political sense. So I, I think that um, it's a social organism. It is a social organism, and where it becomes really skewed and hard to sort of pin down. So I'm I'm talking about sort of a. Uh, amorphous hive. Yeah, right? hive. Yeah, that's a good image. Yeah. Um, and I, with complete artistic control that I am unwilling to bend on. Yeah. I mean, like, I'm willing to talk about it. I'm willing to be enlightened. But I'm not willing to give up. Yeah, the, that, the, that vision. Where, how the vision really works. And, and to that point. Which would be great if it could be sustained. Yeah. And I mean, like, which, which makes me the queen. Which yeah. I am fine. Yeah, like right. what a what an honor. Yeah, yeah. If what an honor if that's true. But in the same sort of way of okay, what I want to do is I want to make this thing because I think it's important. The thing that I'm making that I think is important is the bagel. The bagel I think is important because when people eat, they stop dying and they rebuild their cell structure and continue living. I think when we engage in commerce, we're doing the same thing. And I think how we engage inside of business is the same thing. And I think that once you look at the thing that you're doing, which again is intended to heal people and start making decisions that are contrary to that in the interest of the other parts surviving, yeah. I, don't, I don't believe that the end result is true. I don't believe that when you begin sacrificing the idea and the reality of what you are feeding people for a speed or efficiency that will get you an economic gain, yeah. that in the long run that pays off for us as a society. So that, so in a sense, you, in the context of the bagel shop, if you start to compromise on the integrity of your methodology itself, that the hand shaping, the, the dedication to the craft yep. itself that the craft will say is is the is is the most valuable part of this equation. Yep. That if you have to compromise on that, then the, it, you you can't win by trading it off for more economic value for making more money. I I don't believe so. But if I, you but if you could have if you could make enough money to sustain the hive 
and stay true to the craft, then it could work for a longer period. Sure. But in order for that to happen, you need to be, be able to make a lot more money because you need at least another fill in the place to take so that you don't burn out. Right. That, that's that's and exactly. that's where the whole, the that's, whole hive breaks down. That's exactly right. The 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 line that keeps bopping through around my head is, uh, like any Gemini, I thought I could do it on my own. Uh-huh. Right? There you go. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and wrong, right? The... I... I am very, very, very lucky to have worked with people who are not me, right? Uh-huh. Because that is where I get to get to perspectives that I yeah, wouldn't get to otherwise. Not everybody sees things the way you yeah, see them. Yeah, which is yeah, beautiful. That's an important thing. You know? What that also does is reassures somebody of what their tone and their sound is. So I always fall back on this, but it is so much like being, I think, um, a producer in a band in a room trying to get a sound yeah. for a song. Yeah, yeah. And what you're not trying to do is figure out how to play one song the same way over and over and over again. You're trying to build a room where there's enough space for everybody to get to the sound yeah. that's the sound of none of them, but the sound of all of them. Uh-huh. All of which is intended theoretically to serve the song, which in our case is every dough. Yeah. Right? To get that to where it's going so it connects. And it's the practice of that, the habit of that, the discipline of that, the work of that that I find to be interesting yeah. and worth putting money into, um, to a fault maybe. You put in a lot of blood, sweat and tears into it for sure. Very lucky, but, yeah. But then again, as you said, in the end, is, this, is, this, is it a sustainable model? Um, not, not, not so much. That's, uh, the, the stammering is because Scott Wiener Scott, is- Scott Wiener just is, came by. Is, uh, Sorry, Scott, I don't want to interrupt, you. but I just got to... I love you. Oh, I'm just going to join us on another episode. I don't want to interrupt. All right, I see Phil Korshak sitting over here with Peter Reinhardt, and my brain explodes, and Liam, who I haven't seen in a year. And I'm sorry, my heart and my brain, they're not exploding, they're implumping. They are. Oh, and we're I'm all smelling nice here. <laughs> Scott, well, well, Scott th- we, we want to get you back for a whole you know, I'll session be back. with you. Like, I got to go and judge. Thanks, thanks for I'm so time. glad to see you. One of, the, one of the beauties of being in a live venue like this is oh. the cool, unexpected stuff can happen. What a capital M mensch. Yeah. What a nice, yeah. nice man. Yeah, and, and, uh, and Scott is doing uh, some really important work with, with Slice Out Hunger, oh. in, in, which is the philanthropic side of his commerce. So, yeah. which is, again, for him, his system works because he can make it financially work, not burn out, uh, do what he loves to do, yeah. and make it an and. Part of what makes it fulfilling for him is he also has a give back mechanism. Right. And I, I, he is a super, super special, talented, wonderful, genuine human being. The, when they write the book about him, the story of the building of the community underneath him and around him and how organic yeah. that is, right? how his outreach for community built a community that also moved inside and out like a coral reef, right? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very beautiful. That is like Scott. Yeah. Scott is this beautiful part of a growing he, reef he, that builds a bay of he safety. He found a way to achieve something along the lines of what you were trying to achieve, and he found a model that yeah. works for him. That's right. It looks right. like it could be sustainable as long as his energy holds out. Yeah. He's got you know endless energy, but... But also, there's a, the economy, the economics worked right. to sustain it. Uh, the bagels, as an economic model, maybe was too limited in what it could, what it could I, do. I definitely think so. I mean, the, the, anyone in the business will tell you that where you start really making money with bagels is in wholesale. Yeah. And wholesale is about making lots and lots and lots and lots of them. That's the lend, people who started Lenders Bagels. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and that's... That's true, and that's that's okay, and no disrespect to the people who uh, do wholesale, yeah. and much respect to the people who go out of their way to get bagels that they love. But I am sort of really dedicated to keep reminding myself that the important thing is the interaction human to human. Uh huh. 
and that every disconnect for a person who goes to the market that buys the thing where they don't think about or put together that, oh yeah, there's 75 other people that had to be around for that to happen. Yeah. And the, the more sort of numbly we go through life. Yeah. And, you know, I, like I said, I think it's habit and uh, discipline of how we go through our day. Well, you were trying to achieve something that goes against the, the grain of, of our current society because people, like you say, most people yeah. don't think about all the connections that, right. that bring a piece of meat to your table or, uh, or, yeah. or a loaf of bread or, right. or uh, you know, split pea soup or something. You know, it wasn't, yeah, the, it, was, it was Anthony Bourdain who was the first one to sort of peel back and let people say out loud, oh, there are other people that make this happen. Yes. Yes, right? yes, yes. Whereas for, you know, like lots of years, that was still true, but nobody was looking at it and nobody was talking about it. And and I think what, it, you know, what you're describing there, what, what Bourdain did was, is this, you know, he did, he showed the, you know, the, the deeper picture. Right. But, um, but also, it, you know, he... It was a sorrowful journey for him. As much as it looked like he was having a lot of fun, clearly it was sorrowful because the pain that he endured by seeing the limitations yeah. of of where people are at versus him as a, as a, an artist and a writer yeah. more than he was a cook even, but a, an artist that sensitive soul. It, it it was again he couldn't sustain the pain of that. No, the I think that so Bourdain was a person who was born on third. And you know, got 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 a homer pretty quickly. I mean, yeah. like you know, he was a he was a educated, wealthy kid uh -huh. who got to slum and sort of try out being a dishwasher. Yeah. And for whatever reason, whether it was punk rock or drugs or the reality that kitchen work is holy work, he caught it and understood, and then got an article written that was really, really well written. Yeah. That got him the exposure. That as became a writer. Kitchen Confidential, yeah. yeah. And, and then all of a sudden he exploded on the scene. But, but his every missive that he wrote was about <laughs> his connection to and his detachment from this very primal world of cooking with integrity. Yeah. And that's why people really, you know, loved him and connected with him, uh, not realizing, you know, the, the, the cost yeah. to him of, of sustaining that, which brings me back right. to you, because you've just gone through, in a sense, the death of your business. Oh, sure. And yeah. with, now, now you are one week away from that and in the process of grieving. Yeah, that's right. So what, that talk about right. that a little bit. The So the with Bourdain, it's important to remember that he was such a huge Hunter Thompson fan. Fan, yeah. So, you know. It's like, context here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like that. Then some of the some of the tropes follow through. What I've come to think about grief is that the the Emily Dickinson line is grief is the thing with feathers. And the thing that I like about that image is that every time you touch a feather, it moves differently. It's got its own sort of like I don't know, Paul, but the you can go against the grain with it. It can be ticklish or it cannot be ticklish. It, it defies gravity in the way that it floats and falls. And it's impossible to think of a single feather without thinking about a chicken, which is a weird, very scary dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, <it's> true. <laughs> and almost all the things with feathers out there are weird, scary dinosaurs. Interesting. The human instinct that I've realized inside of myself is that I think that if I understand a tool for grief, that I will be able to use that tool for grief forever. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And what I have found to be true, and I think this is explicitly beautiful, is that every singular grief requires a tool of its own invention. There is no grief that is like other grief. How we deal with it in the present will always be different than whatever we did beforehand. Uh. With the grief around the death of the shop, 
I was lucky enough in that there was a week's uh, notice to the public that it was not going to be a shop. And the public turned out in droves of dro- hundreds yeah, droves. day after day. My after brother day. was in the line with hundreds of people around the corner around, waiting to get the, the last bagels that were going to be made. Around two mm-hmm. corners. I walked between 11th and 10th so many times. It holds about 300 people. If you're in a line of three to 400 people for a bagel shop that makes roughly a thousand bagels. Yeah. None of us are really that bad at math. Yeah, right. Right. So none of us are really there for this bagel at the end result. Right. Everybody who was there really, really seemed to be there to be there with everybody else who was simply sad. And to say goodbye. And to say goodbye. And to say thanks. I mean, like, that was a, a part I really didn't, I didn't anticipate and didn't think about. A lot of people went out of their way to simply remark, this meant something to me. End of statement. No, you know, like, that's, that's, and that's the most massive compliment that anyone could ever yeah, receive. Yeah, absolutely. The part that I think is really great is that all of these human beings who were drawn to this weird bagel shop in yeah. a weird time were able to see that none of them were alone. That's the part where we as a society, back to a shop, back to a team, back to a crew, where we really, really hit a high note is with one another. That's how harmony is achieved. So in a, in, a, in a sense, you achieved the mission of the shop, even if it wasn't a long-term run, you, you've touched a, a community of people you in bet. a way that they haven't even thought it through yet. It'll, it'll start to unfold for them over time. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you're still unpacking it yourself. You're still reflecting on what it all meant. But but it but in one sense there was a success without doubt there there is not a not a question in my mind about whether the thing that happened with that bagel shop was successful or not it is beyond the scope of expectation of what success actually is yeah yeah and to have been witness to it proxy to it and still inside of the hurricane itself yeah is i think a pretty good way to talk about it yeah. i mean the all right let's go with that i like it a hurricane is a weather system <laughs> yeah i got to be an eye of a hurricane for a little while yeah, you were you were at that you were the eye of the hurricane yeah that is a a massively wonderful place to be yeah because the, because in one sense the, the eye of the hurricane is the calmest part of the hurricane yeah yeah, yeah. and that, in this moment yeah. after you know not uh, a week and a week out so yeah. this time last week the last bagel went out the door yeah okay and my brother got it yeah right and <laughs> and then sent me a picture with your mother oh yeah and, I, and he brought it to my mother yes oh, yes yes yes, yes. Yeah, it feels like the eye of the hurricane. Yeah, like it, it yeah, really yeah, is a place yeah. of peace and calm. Yeah, and the the other part that I sort of really celebrate and think is important is that what the bagel shop could do and what happened is really really cool. What will happen next in the world? Yes, is really the intriguing part. That's right. And there are a whole lot of people who worked at that bagel shop who will go out and do other things. And like this one cat, CJ and his wife Daria, CJ and D, yeah. Trenton Pies, Tomato Pies, unbelievably good stuff. And I wasn't a part of why they started, but I hanging out with them and them hanging out with me in the bagel shop, that's part of why they, I am now part of their tone and I, I could not be prouder. It's funny, as you're describing that, I'm thinking my, uh, of this, this image that comes to me is of Richard Burton singing to Juliet, to uh, not to Juliet, but to a young child at yeah. the end of Camelot, 
uh, saying there was a time, right, and never forget it that the Camelot actually existed, right, and it will go down and you know in Lord, but it's inside of you now. Yeah, no, that, and that's that's right. Like that's the and you know it is fitting that at an expo, which is all about okay what can happen next yeah 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 you get to talk about what happened last yeah well and, and each of these people that were touched you know have an opportunity to, to, to do something with that as well but, right. but but what people really want to know is is what's going to be next for you and and, and, and yeah. it's probably too soon to know it's totally too soon to know until i know what happens with the actual building yeah and how the equipment sorts out and whether there is somebody in the world who's going to have an idea of how it can still be Korshak Bagels and go on, or whether the employees will figure out a way to get their own company together and try to do it. Yeah, so that's not, yeah. none of that's resolved yet right. for people who are wondering. Yeah. And by the time this airs on the air, we'll be a few more weeks down the road, so there so something will idea. have changed. But it's one scenario possibility yeah. is that the that the employees could end up saying, I want to buy it back and, and keep it going. Right. Uh, or someone else can come in and, and buy it and keep yeah. it going. Or it could just fade away completely. Or it could just fade away completely. Or somebody else could take over the space and do something do really, something really different. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is more than likely. I mean, like, that that for sure, on whatever level will happen. It's a magic corner and a magic neighborhood. Yeah. But then as you process all the lessons that you take from this, from yeah. these experiences, two, well, it's more than two and a half years for you because you started it well over a year and a half before it ever even opened yeah. and you ran into all sorts of the usual problems with getting zoning through and, and permits and all that stuff. Yeah. So it was a long process um, for theoretically a short run but, and again and now just to a Broadway show that spends years in development yeah. and, and, and imagine after all that if they close after opening week you that's know right. the pain and the, and the grief that everyone goes through. Yeah that's about but, right. But, but there's takeaways for you. Oh what, yeah. Can you, can you speak to any of the the current takeaways, I know that more will emerge as you have time to reflect. So I think the the big one is still the one about trusting the dough. So really, really being as present as possible. Mm. How to be kind in the present. How do I pull? Thank you. Thank you. As people are walking by, giving giving Philip love. People who know him are walking oh, by, giving him love signs. Thank you. Spread bakery. Good stuff. There you go. Look the, at that. There is no such thing as over communication. Yeah. That one, I think, is a really good lesson. So, so was under communication a, 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 an issue then? I think in, so. In I, I, so I think that. What's important to understand is that over-communication will, by necessity, become awkward. So for human beings to truly understand one another, they have to be in agreement with whatever it is they're really talking about. And we as human beings are really pretty well programmed to go, okay, whatever. Yeah. And to, to avoid conflict, I mean, not for any nefarious reason, just to avoid conflict. And so the, okay, do you get what I mean? Yeah, I get, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll do it. Okay, right. it's fine. Right. And then the sort of follow up around that, if it's not quite what you want, yeah. it's still gonna be awkward to go, yeah, yeah, I, this really isn't quite what I want. What I want is this, knowing that the interaction will be of the, well, why are you busting my balls when it's really getting done anyway? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, well, let's now have a philosophical conversation about what things being done yeah, are. Yeah. And if you can press through that, then you will get to gold, right? You will get to the place of human beings understanding one another. But I think this is one of the challenges that any, quote, intentional community runs into. Intentional communities right. by nature so can't really work unless everyone, like in the beehive, is programmed to be on, on the same page. Yeah. And people aren't like that. So you're going to pull together any kind of intentional community and you're going to have lots of people who eventually, this isn't working for me. Right. And and, and businesses are like that. They're, it's an intentional community of its own. And people can leave the business or not leave the business. But, uh, but the business could go on if the economic model and the leadership the queen bee, so to speak, right. can sustain life. Yeah, and yeah. that's, I mean, like, and that's the, that's sort of the, the big piece. And yeah. that's also, it is so obvious to me now that I am 
embarrassed, but like I said, when I opened it up, the idea was about a business that could afford a work-life balance in a meaningful uh, profession. The meaningful profession shot part, I got right. The work-life balance part, I really got wrong. And the longer I held on to it still being wrong, the worse it got. And I should have been sitting here last year That's right. at this exact you time. You were supposed to be here last right. year, and you couldn't be here because you were in the middle of trying to sort out all these challenges. I was in the middle of sorting out a vent exhaust problem uh -huh. that dated back to the first company that installed the first exhaust. Yeah. So, you know, a, a decision that haunted me from a year and a half beforehand where I went, yeah, you guys know what you're doing. Go ahead, put that, that that's what you, yeah. great. Yeah. If that's the exhaust that ought to be there, go right ahead. Fast forward, wasn't the right exhaust. Yeah. As a result of that, the employees, rightfully, were unhappy about working in a very smoky kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so See, how do I deal with yeah. it? And so on. Had I, in the moment of dealing with the person who was installing the HVAC, had I the tenacity to go, look, I really don't understand how it's going to do it, so can you kind of really make it clear to me? Because what I, my expectation is that there won't be smoke. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I did. Well, that's how, those are the, how, the painful lessons that yeah. we learned the hard way. Yeah, that I think are applicable to every moment of every day. So I'm, I, since we're coming to the end of this show, I'm going to ask you if you have any sense or intuition that there is a model that exists out there. You, you've still got some mileage left on the tread. Oh. You know, people will see you on Instagram and think, this guy, he's an old guy. He must be like 80 years old. You got this long beard. You got yeah. long hair. But you're really a young guy. You're younger You're yeah. younger than a lot of people on the floor here. That's true. Uh, so you got, you've got at least another act or two in you. Oh. You see... So, and I know it's too early to know what it yeah. is, but do you have a sense that there is a way to achieve this ideal vision that you have? Because it's a high, it's a high ideal idea. I do. Idea. I, I mean, I, one, the, for whatever reason, my tenacity and my stamina is consistent. So, you know, like, what gets to happen next? I am really excited for finding out what that will be, knowing that none of it will come like a lightning strike. Yeah. That all of it will unfold like a good Russian novel. And you know, like that, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm down. That's, yeah. that's swell. Yeah. I think the model that will work will, I think, have to be fully employee owned. Ah, there you go. Well, there's a, that way you get more buy-in and yeah, and and accountability. Yeah, I think, and I think. So I think that the question of everybody when they walk into the job about why they're there and whether they want to be there or not, whether they need to be there or not, is really only a question that every last individual can ask for themselves or answer, right? If you are in a work situation which is salary-based and a quid pro quo for work, I do think that it's really hard to engage in that without resentment being the end result. I have never seen an amount of money at the end of it that is so green yeah. where I have not thought, yeah, and they're still getting over on me. Or we're still as a bartender that I used to work with in New York, guy from Minnesota, used to say, he used to say, uh, you know, Phil, sometimes you gotta drink yourself to $20 an hour. <laughs> and he wasn't wrong, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, like he was, whether it was ethical or not, the reality is the employee would figure out a way to get the money that they felt they deserved. And yeah. right, yeah. wrong, yeah. not here to judge, yeah. but I think if it is all employee owned, well, then that- That's, that, that's a, a, a pretty biggie. Uh, for sure, and and one takeaway that I got from as you were retelling this is, is, is that maybe when ideating a vision of a of a of a business is to have partners to go into it with you who who are already on the same page as you that, yeah. you, that they're not employees they're not you don't have to bring them on but that they they're already there yeah. who already 
are willing to share the load. Oh no, without, it is so big, I think that's why I didn't even mention it. None of us should do anything alone. Yeah. yeah. None of us really have to. We are so better served when we work in context with one another. Never try to do this alone. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end Thanks, this conversation Peter. because that I'd like that to yeah, stay with people. Me too. So, Philip Korshak, thank you. Welcome back to the world. Thanks, to, Peter. To the world that you left for two and a half plus years. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, we can't wait to you know hear more Thanks. of your story as it unfolds and whatever the next act, act two, act three, whatever it's going to be, uh, where it all leads. Because, of course, we love talking with you about these things because. You know, to me, you're the you're the poet laureate ha! of the artisan movement, and uh, and we love having you here on Pizza Quest. Uh, you know, thanks, Peter. The it is a it is a true pleasure to see you. You light yeah. me up with inspiration, and every time I get to sit and talk with you, I feel like we're on the Ken Kesey further bus. Yeah, we are. <laughs> thanks for taking have, me further. We have so many things in common. I think one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right, thanks, well, Peter. wonderful to see you. Thank you, and thank all of you for listening to Pizza Quest, for joining us here, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Pizza Quest is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.